Hello, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the uh, third BEPS webcast. Uh, thank you for tuning in wherever it is you're tuning in from. This is our, as I said, third opportunity to speak directly with you about the ongoing work on the BEPS project, <clears throat> as well as uh, progress that we're making towards the deliverables, both the 2014 deliverables to be presented in September to the G20 meeting, G20 finance meeting in Cairns, as well as the 2015 deliverables. Since the last webcast, there have been um, a number of public consultations. Um, we're going to try to run through some of the content of those. I have the pleasure of welcoming back today, uh, to begin with, uh, Pascal Saint-Amand, who's the director of the OECD Center for Tax Policy Administration, as well as two of the key uh, uh, other uh, OECD officials working on the BEPS project. That would be Rafael Russo, who's the head of the BEPS project. Rafael will talk about the report on the tax challenges of the digital economy, as well as Marlies de Reuter, who's the head of the Tax Treaty Transfer Pricing and Financial Transactions Division. Marlies will be telling us about treaty abuse, transfer pricing elements of the BEPS work. Um, I should mention <clears throat> right now at the outset of the webcast that we will, as we've done in the past, be taking your questions. Um, so please um, feel free to submit them either uh, via email, you see an address there. Also, uh, feel free to weigh in uh, via Twitter using the hashtag BEPS. Um, we'll answer as many of those questions as we can after the presentations. We're going to start with uh, Pascal, who's going to provide a bit of an overview on the progress, work accomplished uh, so far, and uh, talk to us also about ongoing engagement with developing countries. Pascal? Thank you, Larry. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to you all. Happy uh, to see you uh, today or to talk to you today on our project for the uh, latest update uh, and the last update for before the uh, summer. And uh, we um, are happy to, to report on the fact that uh, we're on schedule. Uh, it's uh, difficult, but we're getting there and uh, we're making very good progress, actually, uh, in spite of the tight uh, deadlines. Uh, you have here a table which shows the comprehensiveness of the action plan and the 15 actions within the three main blocks, uh, the coherence block, the substance block, and the transparency block, uh, as well as the two uh, uh, horizontal uh, projects. Uh, you can see uh, in light blue uh, the deliverables uh, to be supplied to the G20 finance ministers in September, namely, the digital economy report, uh, which is the horizontal one at the bottom of the table. Uh, this is a report which is due and uh, a report is being finalized. We'll come back uh, to this later, but uh, the report will be ready uh, on time for the finance minister's uh, meeting. Uh, then we do have something which is different from a report because it's about a uh, draft uh, domestic legislation model uh, as well as draft uh, treaty provision models. It's on hybrid mismatch arrangements. That's the action two into the coherence block. And in this coherence block, we also have the harmful tax practices work. Uh, you know about this work, which started in 1998. Uh, it uh, identified the number of regimes, 47, I think, which were potentially harmful. Most of them were dismantled. All of them, actually, at the end of the day, were dismantled. And now we are revamping this work uh, by uh, realigning uh, substance and location of profit in terms of the criteria and the way we interpret the criteria. We're deepening the issue of transparency, and we are uh, reviewing uh, the regimes based on this. A progress report will be made to the finance. Uh, ministers of the G20 as well. Then we're moving to substance, uh, realigning substance uh, and profits. That's the second block. And there we have two major deliverables, one on tax treaty, developing treaty abuse, anti-treaty uh, abuse measures, uh, anti-abuse measures there. And uh, Marlies will report on the progress made there on an LOB provision as well as a main purpose test uh, provision to be included in the model tax convention. But we also have completed the work on the transfer pricing aspects of intangibles. You may remember that this work started before the BEPS project, but obviously it's one of the key components of the BEPS project. And here also so a uh, draft uh, revision of the transfer pricing guidelines will be available 
for consideration by the finance ministers of OECD and G20 countries. The third block is about uh, transparency, and uh, here another very significant piece uh, related to transfer pricing with a country-by-country -country reporting template as required by the G8 and by the G20, but it's not only limited to country-by-country -country reporting, which is very visible from a political perspective, but also to all transfer pricing documentation, a master file or country file, and here also Mali's will give you the latest update. Finally, another report is due to the finance ministers of the G20 in September. It's a report on the feasibility of a multilateral instrument. Uh, we have made tremendous, tremendous progress there. We do have a draft report uh, which uh, indicates that all this is feasible and all this should happen to streamline the implementation of the BEPS uh, action plan. Where are we in all that? Well, you know that, I'll be quick. Um, we have published discussion drafts. We have had, uh, since the last uh, um, webcast, public consultations, uh, which were streamlined, streamed uh, live. Uh, they were attended by both business representatives, NGOs, academics, uh, and uh, you will see, based on the comments we've received, they've been pretty successful. And uh, th further work now will be done in the coming days by the working parties before being finalized by the Committee on Fiscal Affairs. Just to give you a hint of the interest triggered by this work, uh, you will see in this very shiny table uh, the, um, how the comments have been shared between the different uh, uh, actions and uh, where they come from. So what you can see first from this table is, uh, from this chart, is that we have received more than 450 comments, uh, 462 precisely, and uh, that's over 3,500 pages of comments. I've, I'm very often asked, what do you do with the comments? We don't trash them, we read them all, and uh, uh, they are all scrutinized, and uh, we do, as a secretariat, make summary of all the comments. Unsurprisingly, actually, even though you may have hundreds of pages of comments, you just have a few key ideas there, but sometimes we realize uh, things that uh, were not planned and which have been identified, and then we pass them on to the working parties for discussion, there is the public consultation, uh, again, which is live, which is public, uh, where uh, businesses, NGOs, or other stakeholders can comment, do comment. The country delegates take into account these comments when they further meet uh, after the public consultation. You can see that um, transfer pricing documentation is probably uh, the one which has drawn the most uh, attention, but uh, treaty abuse, uh, transfer pricing intangible, hybrid mismatches, digital economy, that's, that's a, good, uh, a good share. And you can see who has commented. Uh, well, non-member countries only one, but actually it's much more than that because we've had uh, regional consultation, so uh, it's probably more than tens, uh, tens of countries which have commented there. Uh, but we receive one official through this channel, one official comment. Academia is interested. Um, the NGOs and civil society uh, have been active. And uh, unsurprisingly, uh, businesses and lobbies, which are um, uh, organizations like USCIB or BIAC or uh, uh, other former organizations, the uh, MEs uh, themselves and uh, the low and account firms have massively uh, contribute, contributed there. We have also, as I just indicated, engaged with developing countries. Uh, here, not a lot uh, news to report uh, compared to our previous uh, webcast. Still a recap there, because this is extremely important uh, for both uh, the G20, the members, the business community, the NGOs. We need to develop one set of standards having all the G20 or OECD countries represent 85% of the world economy. We could be proud of, of having 85% of the world economy developing the standard, but that's not enough. We need 100% of the world economy, and that's why engaging with developing countries is so important. So based on the regional events that I mentioned last time uh, we talked uh, at the previous webcast, and the different global fora on tax treaty, on transfer pricing, on VAT, 
We have drafted a report to the G20 develop, Developing Working Group. Uh, this uh, develop, uh, Developing Working Group uh, met uh, a couple of weeks ago in Hobart uh, in Australia, and uh, it welcomed our work. Uh, we are due to develop a part two of the report, which will be about recommendations for developing countries to benefit from BEPS, and uh, this will be developed over the summer. The BEPS project uh, priorities from a development perspective, excessive payments, uh, in particular in respect of interest, uh, service charges, management, technical fees also is uh, one of the key priorities for developing countries. The supply chain restructuring uh, that uh, contractually reallocates uh, risks uh, and associated profit to affiliated companies in low tax jurisdictions, unsurprisingly, uh, came pretty high, uh, as well as the uh, difficulties in obtaining the information. This is something quite significant. We hear from emerging developing economies that their ability to access the information is much lower than uh, what uh, is the perception of developed uh, countries. And uh, finally, treaty shopping uh, is considered as uh, a source of concern. Two additional topics were highlighted in this report. Uh, one is about uh, the wasteful tax incentives to attract investment that developing countries consider as the major BEPS issue, even though some are disputing whether it's BEPS or not. What matters is that they have told us, this is a key priority for us, please work on this. This is reflected in the report which was presented to the Development Working Group. And finally, uh, the um, uh, techniques to shift uh, the right to tax uh, capital gains, uh, to make it short, uh, which has been identified by the IMF as uh, a major source of concerns uh, by developing countries. So that's where we are uh, in terms of uh, consultation process, in putting the, 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 the ideas and the comments by the developing countries. But most importantly, uh, we have made tremendous progress in finalizing the different uh, documents, the uh, seven deliverables, and now we'll go quickly uh, to uh, some of them. So, uh, Larry, back to you. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Pascal. Speaking of going quickly, we'll turn the floor straight over to Rafa um, to talk about progress in the work on the digital economy. Thank you very much, Larry, and uh, good day, uh, everyone. I'll uh, give you an update on the work of the Digital Economy Task Force. Uh, as you know, we published a discussion draft in, in March. Uh, we received comments, as you have seen from the previous slide, and we discussed the, these comments with uh, uh, the different stakeholders uh, in uh, Paris at the OECD headquarters on the 23rd of, of April. Uh, what emerged from the public consultation, which was extremely useful for the task force in carrying out its, its work, was that uh, there is uniform agreement from all the stakeholders, whether it's business, whether it's NGOs, civil society, academics, uh, uh, or uh, 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 tax advisors, that there is no point in ring-fencing the digital economy. And the digital economy is and will increasingly be the economy itself. There was also a widespread support expressed for the way the digital economy is uh, uh, presented, what the key features that the task force has uh, identified are, and business models that either are completely new or uh, whose scale has increased dramatically in the, in the last few years. There was also agreement on the fact that the work that is being carried out uh, in the context of the OECD G20 uh, BEPS project will indeed address uh, 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 most of the BEPS issues raised by uh, the digital economy and that actually when carrying out uh, some of this uh, 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 work, certain of the key features and the business models of the digital economy will have to be taken into account in order to ensure that the solutions actually address effectively these uh, uh, BEPS issues. Uh, there was also uh, 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 widespread agreement on the fact that uh, the uh, issues related to VAT 
are uh, uh, fundamental. These are really issues that go to the heart of, of the issue of, of the level playing field. Uh, as a customer, if you can uh, uh, buy from a local uh, seller uh, paying 100 plus the VAT or from a foreign seller paying only 100, it's, it's obvious that this creates uh, distortions in, in markets and, and, and needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, we did uh, 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 hear uh, quite uh, some concern, particularly from uh, uh, business and, and tax advisors, about uh, uh, some of the options that uh, have been uh, discussed by the task force, in particular in relation to direct taxation and in particular in relation to the issue of nexus and um, uh, data for uh, uh, tax purposes. Uh, we also heard, interestingly, uh, some additional uh, suggestions which were made by stakeholders in relation to other possible options that uh, could be considered by the task force. What the task force then did was to reconvene uh, uh, only with the government officials and discuss these comments and uh, the way forward. Then what happened since the last meeting of the task force, which was in April, was that basically we worked hard to produce a draft report that will take into account the comments received and the progress made. And, as you can see from the slide, the task force is actually meeting uh, uh, this week in order to uh, finalize the uh, report and uh, uh, send it to the Committee of Fiscal Affairs for uh, final approval. Uh, what is the uh, content of the discussions these days is first finalize the description of the digital economy, the key features and business models. Uh, we had some very interesting comments on the need to reconcile the fact that the report uh, talks about volatility as one of the key features, but at the same time talks about tendency to monopoly or oligopoly. <clears throat> and therefore we did work uh, to reconcile that. Then, uh, uh, spelling out in uh, more detail how uh, the other actions of the BEPS action plan will tackle the BEPS issues that arise in, in the digital economy and what uh, specific features should be taken into account. Finally, the uh, core of the discussions will likely be on the uh, broader tax challenges raised by the digital economy. As you know, uh, uh, the, the, the draft that was published and eventually the final report makes uh, make a distinction between BEPS issues understood as issues of uh, double non-taxation or artificial segregation of taxable income from the jurisdiction where uh, the economic activities are carried out uh, from broader challenges that actually go beyond uh, uh, that. Uh, there was an initial analysis of the uh, options that were presented to uh, the task force and the discussions will have to focus on how to address the interactions between the broader tax challenges on the one end and the BEPS issues on the other, considering that the work on BEPS is being finalized as far as the 2014 uh, deliverables are uh, concerned and will continue in 2015 as regards the 2015 uh, deliverables. Uh, we hope that at this meeting we will uh, uh, reach agreement on all the pending issues and be able uh, to respect the schedule which provides for the uh, report to be sent to the G20 finance ministers in September this year. Thanks very much, Rafa, for that uh, important update on the digital economy issue. I'm going to go right back to you, in fact, uh, to talk about progress on hybrid mismatch arrangements. Thank you, Larry, and I'm, I'm doing that in the absence of uh, my colleague, Akin Pros, who uh, leads the Secretariat to Working Party Number 11, that is the subsidiary body of the CFA in charge of uh, 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 hybrids as well as a number of other action items. Uh, again, uh, uh, in the spirit of, of full transparency and recognizing the importance of the input from uh, uh, external stakeholders, we published a discussion draft in March. Uh, in this case, we gave more time for comments. Why? Well, because these issues are highly technical and, and require uh, possibly more uh, thinking and, and consultation compared to others. We did have a public consultation uh, 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 on the 15th of May, where again, we heard the representations of uh, all the stakeholders involved. Uh, what is the uh, expected output of the, of the work in this area? As, as uh, Pascal mentioned before, it's 
template prototype model uh, domestic law uh, provisions in order to tackle uh, hybrid mismatch arrangements. There is also uh, like a part of the work which relates to the treaty issues uh, in uh, relation to hybrids, but being hybrids something that arise chiefly because of differences in domestic laws, the key to address them is uh, domestic law changes. So what we are doing in, in that space is to develop rules that link uh, the tax treatment of uh, an instrument or of an entity uh, with the tax outcomes in the counterparty uh, jurisdiction. So this would effectively prevent uh, the hybrid mismatch to arise by uh, definition. Uh, we have heard several comments in that respect. Uh, we have taken them into account. We believe that it is feasible. There are actually a number of countries that have already gone a long way in, in that respect and that have shared their experience with, uh, with other countries. What the rules will look like is that there will be a primary and a secondary rule. Why is that? Because that means that effectively hybrids will be tackled whether or not both countries concerned have anti-hybrids rules. So you start with the primary rule, but then if the country concerned doesn't have or doesn't apply the primary rule, the secondary rule kicks in. And finally, uh, the, the, the rules also take into account the fact that uh, even if in some cases there may not be a direct hybrid mismatch, so a situation, for example, of deduction, uh, uh, no inclusion, these may be uh, uh, created by interposing uh, certain jurisdictions that don't have these rules and therefore there are also rules to avoid the importation of these mismatches. Uh, as I said, this is highly technical work and there are still a number of technical issues that are under discussions, which we are hopeful that the relevant uh, working party will be able to solve uh, quickly so as to respect the uh, uh, timeline that has been given by the G20 uh, finance ministers and leaders. Thank you, Larry. Thanks very much, Rafa. Um, we're now turned to uh, Marley Zreuter, who will be telling us about what's been going on in uh, Action 6, Preventing Treaty Abuse. Thank you very much, uh, Larry, and a good uh, morning, afternoon or evening to, to all of you. Um, on treaty abuse, we issued, issued a discussion draft on the, in March and had a public consultation very quickly after that. So there was a very short turnaround in relation to the comments to be sent in. Um, the, the public consultation raised a couple of important points. Uh, one of the first points that was very important to recognize is the agreement that the limitation on benefits rule alone will not address all situations of treaty abuse and treaty shopping, and that therefore uh, supporting mechanisms are necessary. Some countries have domestic rules to do that. Sometimes a conduit financing rule is included in the treaty, and, and that is a reason for some countries to also include a main purpose test or to alone include a main purpose test in their uh, treaties. The second very and most important concern that was reflected in the public consultation was the concern about the combined approach, a long limitation on benefits in combination with a main purpose test. And the reason for that is that each of these tests have their benefits and they have their downsides. And what the um, commentators indicated is that by combining them, we lost part of the benefits and duplicated the, the downsides. For example, the certainty that is provided by an LOB would be lost because there would be a main purpose test and the, the, the little amount of uh, administrative burden for good taxpayers would be lost uh, from the main purpose test. So that was something that was very firmly expressed and that we needed to think about following this consultation. Other issues that was, were also brought up in relation to the limitation on benefits rule was that there were some design issues related to the rule that we included. And the rule we included was based on the, v, the, the rules that the United States include in their treaties. And when including, we already recognized that this would not be a fit for purpose rule for all countries because economies differ, sizes differ. But the main issues that were flag, flagged up were that the treatment of collective investment vehicles, pension funds and dual listed companies. And we also had to recognize that, for example, in relation to CIVs, that the rules that we put into the draft were more limited than the rules that were put forward, for example, in a 2010 report on that. 
So we reflected directly in the consultation that it was the intention to go back to the treatment that CIVs had before and not to, to, to bring them in a, in a worse position. There was also a lot of discussion about the derivative benefits test that gives um, uh, companies the same benefits uh, for a direct, uh, uh, than when there would be a direct um, flow of income to the third country. Um, the reason why it was not included was that some countries had the impression that it could be used for base erosion and profit shifting uh, transactions. Uh, those relate mainly to hybrid transactions and to um, issues of uh, preferential regimes. Uh, business gave us a lot of examples of uh, situations, good business situations, that would um, be left out of the treaty benefits if a derivative benefits rule would not be included. Then there was also the issue of discretionary relief, because if you don't pass all the tests in the LOB, you get to discretionary relief. And it was flagged up that, of course, that provision should mean something if we couldn't guarantee that all the good taxpayers would qualify under the limitation on benefits test. So there was a very good discussion during the pu public consultation. And, and the last issue that we also talked about was the interaction between domestic anti-abuse rules and treaty anti-abuse rules. And especially the question, you know, how can we get um, a situation where there is as much certainty as possible and where domestic anti-abuse rules cannot lead to, to, to a, a treaty override. So following from there, we um, went back to WP1 meetings by the focus group on t treaty abuse and, and we thought about the issue. And, and one of the things we decided is, of course, that we needed to address the design rules that I flagged up in the, in the LOB. But also, we decided that probably there is no one-size-fits-all approach. That the intention of the design of this rule is to make sure that treaty abuse and treaty shopping is prevented but that we also recognize that maybe uh, a provision or a way to do that for one country wouldn't work for the other country. So it is recognized in the current draft that there needs to be a bit of flexibility for countries to adopt rules that are fit for purpose for them, but it is also recognized that there needs to be a standard that is effective and efficient, so that countries cannot opt out and therefore create BEPS opportunities for countries. So there is a need for flexibility when possible, but there also need to be a, a rule where uh, treaty abuse and treaty shopping is really addressed by all countries. One of the issues that was also discussed is the inclusion of the derivative benefits test, and, and there we clarified that this issue and this concern mainly relates to hybrid situations and preferential regimes. And we also recognize that hybrids and preferential regimes are addressed in other work streams, and therefore, we need to see what comes out of that. And maybe that will ease or solve the issues in relation to the derivative benefits rule. Last but not least, we recognize that there is a need for flexibility because of the interactions with other work streams. Uh, for example, there will be uh, new domestic rules that will be designed on hybrid situations, on interest deductibility, special me measures in relation to transfer pricing. And for that, those situations, there needs to be a good interaction with the work on treaty abuse. So flexibility is needed to take account of those two 2015 deliverables. So at this stage, we have a draft that is ready for approval by Working Party 1 and by the Committee of Fiscal Affairs. Thank you, Larry. Thanks very much, Marlies. I just remind all of um, you who are watching uh, the webcast now, feel free to send us your questions. You've seen the... Uh, the uh, email, but also uh, interact via Twitter at hashtag BEPS. I'm going to turn the floor directly uh, back to Marlies to talk about the transfer pricing aspects of intangibles. Thank you very much, Larry. And before I go into the draft, um, um, you, the people that regularly watch these webcasts, will have noticed that a very familiar face is missing in the webcast, and that is. Uh, that of my colleague, Joe Andrus. Joe is the head of the transfer pricing unit, and uh, he will be leaving us very shortly. 
So uh, that is one of the reasons why he is not here today. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank him very much for all the work he's done, because much of the work that I'm going to flick up is due to his very high commitment and, and his work. Um, I would also like to reflect that we have a new head of unit, and, and that is Andrew Hickman. So I would also like to take the opportunity to, to welcome him to the team and wish him the best of luck. Um, with that said, I would like to go to the work on intangibles. And, and as many of you know, we have released two discussion drafts, one in 2012, before the BEPS project, and one in 2013. And we received a lot of comments on those drafts. We had the, a public consultation both in 2012 and 2013, but in November 2013 we had very limited time to discuss the issues because we also had to, to set in motion all the other uh, work streams in relation to the action plan. So only in March 2014, so this year and in May this year, we were able to, to, to fully look into the issues in relation to intangibles and to look into the comments. And this is more or less where we came out. We came out with an agreement within WP6 on the revised text of Chapter 1, and I forgot Chapter 2 on the slide, but also Chapter 2 and Chapter 6. And um, we recognize that Chapter 6 is an up-to-date approach to identifying intangibles and also an up-to-date approach on how arm's length considerations should be determined. And it is a full approach to intangibles that is now included in the draft. However, what is also recognized is that there is a strong interaction between Section B and the work on risk, recharacterization and capital. And also the special measures that relate to these issues. And that interaction is recognized. And with that, it is recognized that there will be a follow-up to this work and that therefore the answers that are in this draft are not necessarily the end conclusions after the 2015 deliverables. So, so what will be the next steps? The next step at this stage is that there will be one more round of, of a very quick formal approval by WP6. And after that, and that will take only a week or so, uh, the draft will be sent to the Committee of Fiscal Affairs for uh, approval. What we have also recognized is because of the strong interactions between the Section B in the draft and the work on risk recharacterization and capital, that we needed to speed up the work on um, risk and recharacterization and capital. And for that reason, we have decided that we will give it the most and highest priority and that we will um, issue a discussion draft on these issues in December 2014. And in combination, the work on intangibles and this uh, work on risk and recharacterization will address uh, the issues, uh, the most challenging transfer pricing BEPS issues, including the excessive capitalization, low functionality, and mere contractual assumption of risk issue. And it will develop approaches to hard to value intangibles. And it will do so either within the arm's length principle um, or uh, outside, and either by special measures or not by special measures. Thanks very much, Marlies. We're going to stick with you one more time for an update on the work going on about transfer pricing in country-by-country -country reporting. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. And yes, this is, this is my, my last, but definitely not least, part of the work. And, and, and on this especially, Joe Andrus has worked very, very hard. And, and that is reflected in this slide, because I tried to reflect in this slide what we did the past year to consult with people and to discuss things. And, and as you have seen, we have done a lot, because it's, it's a very small letter type here. Um, we started with a white paper on transfer pricing documentation in July last year. After that, we had a consultation in November, and we came out with a full discussion draft on country-by-country -country reporting and transfer pricing documentation in January. And, and on that discussion paper, we received an immense amount of comments. We received more than 1,400 pages of comments by 183 commentators. So that was a lot. So that reflects that people are really um, engaged with this issue and that it's a very, really important issue for a very broad group of people. And 
that is also what you see when you look at the, the people that have commentated. Those are uh, the NGOs, those are business, academics, and we have had even one comment of a non-member country. That was not the only thing we did with non-member countries, because of course this is a key issue for developing countries, especially the country-by-country -country template, and as Pascal indicated earlier on, you know, they don't have often the access to information that more developed countries have. So therefore, we also consulted with them during the Global Forum on Transfer Pricing in March 2014, where more than 300 delegates from approximately 110 jurisdictions were in place, and we could have a really interactive discussion on this issue. We held our last public consultation on uh, May 19th, and discussed the issues afterwards, and we are now in the process of concluding the draft for approval by CFA and the G20. So, so where, do, where did we come out? Because you know, this was a really complex discussion, and that's also why we needed such a broad consultation, because it, it touches tax issues, but it, it also touches a lot of accountancy issues and practical issues, you know, how do you do this? So I think the first thing to emphasize is that there is full consensus in WP6 that the new approach will greatly improve the access for governments to relevant information for transfer pricing purposes. And that has been a challenge for a lot of countries. So everybody is very happy about that. There's also agreement on the three-tier approach. We will have a country-by-country -country template, we will have a master file and a local file. The country-by-country -country template will contain quantitative information on profits, tax and economic indicators. The other two will contain more qualitative information. And the country by country template is mainly, um, is, is only used or to be used for risk assessment purposes. So it's a very high level uh, report. Um, as these are new tools, um, WP6 realizes that it's very difficult to really assess up front whether these tools will be effective and efficient and whether the focus that we have put in the drafts is right. And that is why WP6 is uniformly of the view that a monitoring mechanism is needed to assess whether the focus of the mechanism can or should be improved in the future. So there will be a time in the future where, where we will assess whether this mechanism is fit for purpose, needs to be broadened, or not. There is also a broad recognition within WP6 that a structured and careful implementation is necessary. And why is it this implementation key? Uh, we recognize that you can have the best tool in the world, but if you don't have the proper implementation, that there will be a, a, an outcome that will not lead to anything. So given how much time and resources need to be spent on these templates, it is very important that the implementation is careful and targeted. That's why there needs to be a, a very careful analysis that will secure consistency in the approaches by governments. A uniform approach is key, that relevant information is available to governments for which it is uh, relevant on a timely basis, so all governments that need the information should get it. Commercially sensitive information should be treated confidentially, uh, confidentially. Costs for both taxpayers and tax administrations should be balanced and there needs to be a security that the information is used as intended so that, for example, the country-by-country -country report is used as a risk assessment tool. In order to do that in, a, in the right way, WP6 said, you know, we need probably more time to look at the implementation tool. And that is why it is suggested that we will come with a full analysis on those issues only on the implementation and, and filing system in January 2015 um, for approval by the, the Committee of Fiscal Affairs. Um, so WP6 will finalize the documents shortly. The template will be finalized at that stage and after that it will be sent to CFA for formal approval. Thanks very much, Marlies. Having looked at a number of individual items, individual elements of action plan, it's probably fitting that we turn now to uh, action 15, which is to say developing a multilateral instrument 
to enable jurisdictions to implement measures being developed uh, in the course of the work on the BEPS project. I'm going to ask Pascal to talk about where we stand on the multilateral instrument. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Uh, indeed, Action 15 is about the feasibility of a multilateral instrument which would amend the bilateral uh, treaties to streamline the implementation of the BEPS action plan. So, a report will be presented uh, as a result, and uh, this report will be twofold. One, a report on the political feasibility of these, and uh, there will be an annex on the technical feasibility. And guess what? The answer is yes, it is feasible. Uh, it is uh, legally feasible. Um, we have had a team of international public lawyers uh, able uh, to find precedents in other areas than tax, able to uh, challenge the uh, different options and uh, to come to the conclusion that indeed it is feasible, we can do it. Um, and uh, this uh, will be a good way uh, to implement the tax treaty related uh, BEPS uh, actions uh, in a way which is efficient, in a way which is compatible with the sovereignty of the uh, states, uh, but also in a way uh, which guarantee that uh, the objectives of fighting BEPS is actually uh, reached. This is feasible, but it's also highly desirable, and that's one of the conclusions of uh, this report, uh, subject for it to be endorsed by the Committee on Fiscal Affairs and then by the G20. But uh, we do see a lot of benefits in uh, streamlining the process by uh, killing 3,000 birds with one stone, which is more efficient than sending teams of treaty negotiators around the world to update uh, their bilateral treaties to follow the uh, evolution of the model tax convention, because then you have uh, gaps between the different treaties. So the same country will take a decade at least to change all its treaties, and during that decade you will have updated treaties, not updated treaties, which gives ground to uncertainty and uh, to treaty shopping opportunities or so, which uh, are good for no one. Um, this instrument uh, would be uh, targeted and it would coexist with bilateral treaties. There are a number of provisions in bilateral treaties which are bilateral by nature and should remain so. So the bilateral treaties will exist, will remain, uh, will be the core of the international tax relationship, but the multilateral convention would be a way to streamline the update of all these treaties. Um, how do we implement uh, this recommendation if it is endorsed uh, by calling on an international conference of all the parties, of possible parties, uh, which would negotiate uh, and then propose for signature and then ratification this multilateral convention? And here, obviously, all the countries uh, which care about fighting BEPS uh, would be invited on an equal footing, uh, which is also a way to ensure that developing countries will have their say, will be on an equal footing in this international conference, again, if, if this is uh, agreed. Um, this will be reported to the G20, and uh, if there is agreement, we could start the work uh, in this area as early as uh, 2015, early 2015. Thanks very much, Pascal. Um, to conclude uh, the formal element of the webcast, um, having looked at the agenda and, uh, and, and where the work stands, um, perhaps you could give us um, a little bit of indication about the next steps and perhaps what, what's coming after the September 2014 uh, milestone. Thank you, Larry. In two minutes so that we have time to exchange with you and respond to your questions. We have already a, a big number of questions we have received from you. Uh, the next steps, uh, very quickly. Well, there are internal next steps and external next, next steps. So internally, what we need to do is to complete the work of the working parties. As Rafa indicated earlier, working party 11 is meeting to draw on the different recommendations and guidelines received from the Bureau on the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, from the public consultation, and for prior work from this working party. That's the same of the task force on the digital economy. Just after this webcast, we'll go to the meeting of the task force, which will start at uh, 2 p.m. French time. 
Working Party 2, which works on Action 11, because you may have seen that we have focused on the 2014 deliverables, but uh, while working on these, we also are working on 2015 deliverables. One of them is uh, the one uh, Working Party 2 is in charge of, related to the spillover effects, to the uh, economic impact of BEPS. And finally, a big meeting will be the Committee on Fiscal Affairs uh, at the end of June, where we have 44 countries on an equal footing, all the G20 all the OECD, Latvia, Colombia, which are in accession process, as well as a number of observers, participants, invitees who will attend that meeting, which will be discussing all this. That's for the internal stuff, and then we'll wrap it up over the summer so that all these can become public when the finance ministers of the G20 will be meeting in Cairns uh, in Australia. Uh, I think it's on the 20th and 21st of September in, in Australia again. And uh, we will have also a report to the G20 leaders at their summit in Brisbane, which is mid-November. Uh, so uh, you have a technical political process first within the tax people, within uh, the OECD G20 BEPS project, we we'll wrap it up of the summer, and then we we'll present that uh, to the G20 finance ministers and leaders uh, by year end, noting that, of course, uh, in parallel, we are working in the 2000 on the 2015 uh, deliverable. So I guess we'll come back to you uh, after the summer and probably before the G20 finance ministers to tell you where we are, and there we will have uh, finalized uh, products. Great. Thank you very much, Pascal and uh, Rafa Marlies. I'm sure that uh, the people watching this webcast and everyone else in the tax community is going to be extremely interested to see that next webcast and the actual, uh, the, the actual conclusions of the work here. But before then, we're going to go to the questions. Right now, as you've said, we've had quite a number. Um, for those of you, before we go to the first one, if you'd like to uh, pose a question, please do. You see you can do it on your screen right there. Uh, there's a space you can fill one in. Other otherwise, by email, ctp.beps at oecd.org. And don't forget to uh, weigh in with a tweet, hashtag BEPS. Um, going straight to the questions now. Um, the first one, I'm going to direct it to Pascal. Um, will the BEPS program be a success if a consensus is not reached on all 15 items? Thank you, Larry. Uh, for the time being, we have seven deliverables and uh, they will be delivered subject to reaching consensus. So the work we're doing is based on consensus. Now, what does consensus mean? It means that everybody is sufficiently happy not to object doesn't mean uh, that we have unanimity of all the countries, but at the end of the day, the 44 uh, participants on an equal footing, the members of the BEPS uh, G20 OECD project, are to agree. So a country not being happy would object. And our work is to make sure, our job is to make sure that they are all sufficiently comfortable. And that's what we are aiming at. So we will have consensus. Now, once we have consensus, we need also to make sure, and that will be the real proof of the success of the BEPS project, that it's properly implemented. And we're already anticipating the issue of implementation to make sure that we have no spillover effects or, or collateral damages. That's where we're grateful to the uh, people who commented, business community, NGOs, who have identified a number of areas. I think Marley's earlier on mentioned the uh, issue of CIV, for instance, on treaty abuse. The policy is not to change the tax treatment of CIV, which are not engaged in BEP, so we're dealing with that. We had some technical questions on repos in the area of hybrid mismatches. We are dealing with that, so that the countries are comfortable that we are addressing their concern, which is to fight BEPS, and that's where we are getting. Acknowledging also that the countries do not depart from the same place. For instance, we all know that Brazil has its own approach to transfer pricing, and so it doesn't prevent Brazil from being happy, and, and we need confirmation at the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, but Brazil is very much involved and is happy with a sense of direction there. So there will be consensus because it's our job to move there while recognizing that governments are uh, sovereign from a tax perspective, that there are some differences, uh, but all this needs to be encapsulated into a common set of standards. And again, not only for 85% of the world economy, but for 100% of the world economy, which is why we're working so closely with developing countries. 
Okay. Um, moving on to another question. This one um, goes back to the discussion just a moment ago about the multilateral instrument. And maybe we'll just ask you to be a, a bit more precise because the questioner person is a bit uh, obviously looking for details. Um, what progress has been made with regard to the execution of proposed changes in terms of the multilateral instrument? Thank you, Larry. Thanks for the question. Actually, uh, we have two streams of work there. One stream is to amend the uh, model tax convention. And the first uh, part of it for 2014 is about the anti-treaty abuse provisions, but also for the anti-hybrid mismatch arrangement. So there we will have tax treaty proposals, tax treaty changes uh, in the model tax convention. And next year, we will probably have a number of changes, for instance, on Article 5 uh, uh, as regards the definition of the permanent establishment and, and some others. So that's one uh, stream where we will update the model tax convention. But would country be happy to say, we all agree that the model tax convention need, needs to be changed and then we'll, we'll I mean, send our uh, tax treaty negotiation team uh, traveling the world to update. That's the second part of the implementation of, of, of the work, which is precisely to develop a multilateral convention to include the outputs of the different deliverables into a framework which would be this multilateral convention. What has been done there is what I've just explained, meaning the feasibility survey. And we have come to the conclusion that it is feasible. There will be a toolkit explaining what the key areas uh, uh, are, uh, what needs to be done, and we are hopeful that if there is agreement, we will call on an international conference to negotiate the framework and being able quite quickly actually to include the tax treaty related BEPS action. So there, in a short time span, we will be able to come up with a multilateral convention which should amend by existing bilateral treaties, again, to streamline the implementation of the BEPS project. So you can see that this moves in parallel tracks, uh, which will allow us to be uh, faster than uh, having the model tax convention updated on the one hand, and then implementation, which would take decades. Okay, thanks, Pascal. I, I, think, I think this is another question for you. Um, are you concerned about the recent statements by uh, U.S. officials about the effect of the BEPS project on the U.S. tax base? Thank you, Larry. Last question I take, then it, it will turn to Marlies and Rafa. Um, well, there have been so many U.S. officials commenting on the BEPS project that I, I don't know which ones you are referring to. Uh, if uh, uh, we take them holistically, I would say we are not concerned at all. On the contrary, uh, we are very hopeful that uh, the U.S. is paying a lot of attention to this. When you look at the budget proposal, you can see that there are some BEPS actions reflected there. The fact that uh, some in the U.S. consider that this issue is not related only to outbound investment, but also to inbound investment, I think is a good thing because it is indeed both an inbound and outbound issue for all countries in the world, starting with the US. And the fact that the US is very much involved in the project, is very supportive of the project, uh, is pretty good news uh, overall, and also a good signal that uh, things within the US will change. We know how difficult it is to proceed with the uh, corporate income tax reform in the US, but uh, the high profile of base erosion and profit shifting project in the US, as well as in the CAMPS proposal and, and, and some others, show that uh, the US is very much involved and it's absolutely necessary if we want to make progress in this area. Great. Thanks very much, Pascal. Popular demand. I'll turn to you, Marlies. Um, question about country-by-country country reporting. Um, with regards to the template included in the country-by-country country reporting, the questioner wonders why there's no evidence of uh, the intangible asset, um, particularly uh, this information, the questioner suggests, would be crucial, uh, in particular for uh, multinational enterprises where the intangible is fundamental to give a fair representation to third parties of the risks and functions within the multinational. Um, the questioner suggests he would expect such information in the revised template referring to the accounting value or uh, the fair market value of the intangible. Maybe you want to develop a little on that. 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Larry, and, and, and thank, thank you for the one posing the question. Um, first of all, I think we, we should keep in mind that the country by country re, uh, report is a, a risk assessment tool. And um, intangibles indeed is a very relevant part of, of many businesses. Intangibles have grown in importance uh, the past 20, 30 years. However, if you look at the available information on intangibles on a quantitative level within multinationals, what you will see is that they very often are not included in the balance sheets. Um, they, they do not need to be there for accountancy purposes um, and that therefore values of them are not readily available. So if we would include them in the country by country reporting template, what would happen is that um, M&Es would have to look for them, identify them and value them in order for it to be included in the template. And, and we thought that that was too much of a burden compared to the use that would be made for that information. Does that mean that the information is not relevant for transfer pricing purposes? Of course not, not at all. I think what it does recognize is that we have a three-tier approach, that we have the country-by-country -country reporting template, that we have the master file and the local file. And of course, in the master file and the local file, intangibles are core issues for which attention needs to be provided in these, in these files. And for example, in the master file, uh, the key intangibles need to be um, identified and need to be described. And in the local file, all relevant intangibles for the entity and the country um, that, is, um, that it relates to need to be reflected. So, so in that respect, intangibles are reflected in the full product that will be delivered. Thanks very much, Marlies. Um, Rafa, I'll uh, put a question to you. Um, will the OECD be recommending a virtual permanent establishment? And if so, how would it determine profit attribution? This is obviously one we've heard a lot about in the press. Please. Thank you, Larry. Uh, the work of the task force so far has been focusing on evaluating a number of, of possible options. Uh, the uh, one of virtual PE or digital PE or significant digital presence PE is one of the options that uh, that has been put on the table by uh, certain countries. Uh, there has been an initial uh, evaluation of these as well as of other options in the in the area of Nexus, and uh, uh, the final conclusions will be reached at the meeting this week. One thing, though, that is clear is that uh, the interaction of the different strands of the BEPS uh, uh, project with this uh, piece of work in relation to the digital economy make it needed that you need to see what happens in relation to all these BEPS issues in order to be able to fully evaluate and decide on the challenges that arise because of the digital economy and the options that uh, uh, can be developed and ultimately implemented in order to uh, address these challenges. Thanks very much, Rafa. We'll uh, come back to you, um, Marlies, with a question on preventing treaty abuse. Um, due to some countries' lack of familiarity and experience with uh, LOBs, do you think this will uh, successfully be applied to future treaties? Thank you, uh, Larry. And here, I, I, again, I think two issues. First of all, the recognition, like with country-by-country country reporting and transfer pricing documentation, that implementation is key and therefore successful implementation needs to be uh, guaranteed. The second thing here is that what I said earlier is that some countries have more experience with limitation on benefits, some have, have experience with other rules, and where we have come out is that the recognition that we need to have some flexibility in the rules as long as, as it is guaranteed that the rules actually effectively target treaty abuse and treaty shopping. Thanks very much. One, one for you, Pascal, which um, we, I think is, is an important question on, on coordination. How, how is the OECD coordinating with the European Union on um, this and related issues, and what's the status of the EU within the OECD G20 BEPS work uh, specifically? Thank you, Larry. We're working very closely with the European Union, with Commissioner Schmitta, with uh, his uh, teams. Uh, 
institutionally, uh, the EU is uh, sort of a member of, of the OECD. That's the 35th member, if we want. And they are included in all the working parties, in the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, on an equal footing. They have access to all the information we share with them. They send comments uh, like all the other countries or all the other delegates. So that's what. But uh, more importantly, on the working level basis, as well as on the political basis, we work uh, very close with them. Uh, we have regular exchanges. Uh, for instance, uh, the EU is about to be issuing a report on the digital economy, which draws extensively on our work. And I think it's good that we have a common understanding of what's going on. There may be some repetition with what we will issue later on, but uh, that's uh, for the good. Uh, and uh, on hybrid mismatch arrangements, there have been very close coordination uh, uh, between the team and uh, the EU team because there were some questions. For instance, could you, in the European Union, do a forced inclusion when you have a parent subsidiary directive? And without close cooperation with them, we may not have come to the solution that is uh, proposed uh, here. And uh, this is the case in many other areas on harmful tax practices as well. Uh, are the solutions uh, contemplated by uh, the different working parties? Uh, in compliance with the EU law, that's something that we shouldn't forget about because there are 28 members of the EU and it would be nonsense to come up with a solution which actually would not work with a significant part of the membership. So very close coordination uh, with the EU uh, that we are very, very happy with, actually. Thanks very much, Pascal. Um, we've reached uh, the end of the hour. I'd like to thank the participants for... Uh, their, their comments and explanations. I'd also like to obviously thank those of you uh, watching and participating uh, via webcast. Uh, the obvious uh, objective of, of this exercise is to get uh, your comments to keep you informed about what's happening here on this important work. Um, please feel free to continue uh, weighing in uh, via the contact email. Uh, all the information uh, that you find about BEPS is, is available on the uh, OECD website and uh, we'd encourage you to go there. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you, obviously, in the future. Um, we'll have a further webcast uh, sometime uh, later this year, I'm sure, prior to the presentation of this work. Thanks very much. Thank you.